The Wilderwood, Part 1 Prologue The champion came alone from the southern desert, like a sand-worn mirage that seemed to barely hold its shape. A guard nudged his fellow, not trusting his eyes. The shape came closer, clearer. It was a man wearing tattered rags, whipped raw by sand and burned red by sun. A sword hung at his waist and a battered shield on his back. He had thrown away everything else. The journey through the desert had been impossibly long, cooking him by day and freezing him by night. He could spare the strength only for his weapons and, of course, for the bag. It was only a crude fold of dirty sailcloth, but inside, the fate of the world. The champion wanted to stop, but he stormed through the gates. He was hungry, but he passed by the market's fragrant stands. He was thirsty, but he did not stop to drink at the plaza fountain. He marched straight through the crowds of the main boulevard and up to the house of the sacred gauntlet. He lowered a shoulder, slamming through the door and into that holy place, down a short hall lined with tapestries and treasures, and then he staggered into the sanctuary. Inside, lit by the red light of a ceremonial forge, the others waited. The blue wizard, the red knight, the green lady. I have returned, the champion said, his voice a wasted thing. And, for good or bad, I have succeeded. They argued then about what to do, for the item in the bag was a great and terrible power. The wizard sought to understand it, the knight to use it, and the lady to cleanse it. The champion only agreed that he would carry it wherever he was asked. They argued until the forge was burned down to a sullen red, their conversation much the same. Finally, it was decided. They would bind the item with their magic until the right time and until the right place. The wizard forged a red chest, the knight banded it in iron, and the green lady sealed it with a spell. In one year, she said, handing the box to the champion for safekeeping, past the edge of the map, where only the dark and endless wild remains. We must go, she said, eyes touching each man in turn, to the heart of the Wilderwood. Chapter One The Wilderwood spread around them, endless and untamed, warm and welcoming, wild as a wish on the wind. Harks's long ride, following the great sail train across the realm, had finally ended. They had arrived at Edgewater, the first step into the Wilderwood, and the last gorgeous gasp of civilization. Last one out's a bugbear's uncle, Harks shouted. She vaulted over the edge of the cart, landing with a squish on the damp road. Mud splattered her robes, but she was too excited to care. The boring ride was finally finished. They'd made it to the Wilderwood, the final forest, the untamed edge of the map. She wanted to see everything, meet everyone. She wanted to experience all the city of Edgewater had to offer. But at the same time, she wanted to leave right away for the deeper paths and the journey that lay before her. She spared a moment to look for Gorse in the grave. The old champion was the one in charge of the red coffer, which was the fancy chest her master was always fussing over. Apparently, it held the mystery that he and the others were meeting about, but that was all Harks had been able to figure out. It was all very secret and serious in that whispery, adult kind of way. She had tried to steal her master's notes, but they'd been enchanted, and the letters had made her cross-eyed for a week. The wagon that Harks thought of as the kitty cart began to empty out behind her. A well-groomed squire climbed down carefully, looking from the muck of the road to Harks and back, as if she was part of the mess he had to stand in. 
Two older boys, attendants to the Axemen who had escorted the sail train, hopped down with a smile and a nod and immediately ran off to care for the horses. Happy to be out of there, eh, nighty night? Hark said to the squire. His name was Lachlan, but she didn't want him to think she cared. After all, with his shiny armor and fancy voice, he was stuck up enough already. Mostly, Harks was bothered that he never laughed at her jokes. Not that it ever stopped her from making them. That wagon was starting to smell like a herd of unicorn got into some bad potion, she said. Lachlan ignored her. Turning his back, he carefully picked his way down the muddy road. No doubt he was off to find Sir Ranseer, the bully of a knight that he squired for. Careful, she called. I hear if you get your boots dirty, your boss will make you lick them clean. That earned her a deep chuckle from the half-giant who stood in front of the kitty cart. He had been hired as a porter, extra muscle to haul crates and lift wagons when they needed servicing. The sail train ran on the power of wind and gnomish invention, but the kitty cart had only a single sail. Days when the wind died, it had been the half-giant's job to put on a harness and pull the cart along. Harks had found him to be a quiet, attentive listener, her favorite kind of audience. How you doing, big guy? she asked. Excited to move boxes in exotic new locations? The half-giant laughed again, a sound like boulders having a party. He was huge, nearly seven feet tall, with cords of muscles running under his blue uniform. But for all his size, he didn't look much older than Hark's. She found it fascinating that one of his arms was missing and had been replaced by a cunning piece of bronze. It looked like scale armor and skeleton with a vice for a hand, but it moved naturally enough. So now that we're in Edgewater, are you finally going to tell me your name? The half-giant laughed again and shook his head. It was the only answer he ever gave her, no matter how often she asked. Are you going to make me guess? She said. Mm, Gigantor? Or Captain Crusher? Oh, oh, I know. Uh, Bobson Dugnuts. Another laugh and head shake, and then the huge man was called away to help the sail train crew. Definitely Bobson Dugnuts, Harks whispered to herself. She looked ahead to where the sail train rested in the great round plaza of Edgewater. The ornate carriages were each housing representatives of the 24 united lands. The vast sails that could shame the largest ship had been furled, and crews of workers in the same blue uniforms as the half-giant tucked them away. In the woods, they had rolled slowly, but the great sails had taken them across the endless plains of the chariot in short order. It was a special craft, used only when important folk from the civilized realms deigned to journey east, and she could hear the cries of celebration as the high lords and ladies slowly made their way off the train and into the great hall of Edgewater. That was for the important people, though. Her master, the great wizard Bobadin the Bright, he would be there. So would Lachlan's master, the paladin Sir Ranseer, and of course, the archdruidess, Gorson the champion, and other heroes of the realm. Harks felt the fire of her magic warm her blood, and she knew that she belonged among them. One day, she said to herself. One day what? came a quiet voice. Harks turned and saw the elven girl leaning out of the kitty cart. One day we'll be up there, she said, jerking her chin at the sail train and the celebration ahead. One day we'll be the important ones. The elf smiled and climbed down from the cart, pointed ears sticking out of her hair. She didn't seem afraid of the mud like Lachlan had, but she didn't splash much either. Her every move was measured like a dancer. She had only ridden with them a few times, and she had always been reserved and quiet, though she seemed nice enough. Harks thought she might try one last time to make friends with her. I bet you can see the whole celebration from that bridge, she said, gesturing at the graceful span the sail train had crossed to reach the round commons at the center of Edgewater. You want to go take a look? To Harks' surprise, the elf girl nodded shyly. Together, they headed along the road, the elf quickly catching up to Harks' excited strides. 
As they neared the sail train, they passed by a prison wagon with a floor and ceiling of oak and iron bars instead of walls. Inside was a small prisoner wrapped in old blankets. A surly-looking elf stood on top, leaning on a gleaming spear and glaring at anyone who happened too close. Any idea who got arrested? Harks whispered. No idea, but it must have been a serious crime, the elf girl whispered back. There are only a couple prisons in the Wilderwood, and once you go in, you can never come back out. Harks whistled. Maybe you can ask that other elf? She asked, nodding at the guard. No, they're a different type altogether, the girl answered back. I'm a wood elf like Shalsani. They're high elves. They think they're better than everyone else. Sounds like Lachlan, Hark said, and they both laughed. I'm going to ask. Don't, you'll get in trouble. What's he going to do, tell my dad? Harks rolled her eyes. Hey, she called. Hey, who have you got prisoner there? The high elf very specifically did not look at her. Hey, you with the pointy ears and the prison wagon. I know you can hear me. The elf guard turned to her with a sneering expression. This prisoner is dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Now run along, or shall I send word to Bobbidin the Bright that his apprentice interfered in high elf business? Harks turned red and held up her hands. Hey, no need for that. Just saying hello. Keep up the great work. Fine guard job you're doing. The girls hurried forward. You were saying something about telling your dad? Quiet, you, Hark said back, and they smiled at each other. As they got closer to the center of Edgewater, Harks noticed the trees, grown high and tight together to form the outer wall of the city. And was that? Were they? Yes! In the sunlight, each tree was blazing bright with yellow light. These trees, Hark said with wonder. They're glowing like a fire barb's behind. The elf girl mumbled something, but Harks missed it over the sounds of the city and the river and the celebration. What was that? To Harks' surprise, the elf tilted back her head and began to sing. Tall as towers, straight as masts, strong as metal, holding fast. Spin a thread from burnished leaves and shelter in the brass oak trees. She finished and blushed red, looking down at her feet again. Wow, said Harks. That was beautiful. Where did you learn that? The elf girl smiled her shy smile. It's one of Shalsani's songs about the Wilderwood. She's been teaching them to me. Harks gasped, excited. Shalsani? Like the archdruidess? Like the one in charge of this whole thing? My master said no one can match her when it comes to nature magic. She's only in charge while we're in the Wilderwood. But yeah, she's amazing. She looked down again, hiding her eyes behind her long hair. I'm... I'm her apprentice. Awesome, said Harks. I mean, I figured you were working with someone interesting, seeing as how you got to ride in the cool kids' cart with me and the squire and the other nearly but not quite junior important people. The elf laughed a little, and Harks smiled. What's your name? she asked her. Nizalia, the girl said. But you can call me Nezzy. I'm Harks the only slightly accident-prone apprentice of Bobadin the Bright. It's nice to meet you. Well, I mean, I know you've been on the cart here and there, but I haven't had a chance to talk to you. Harks didn't mention that Nezzy hadn't really talked to anyone. The elf was a quiet person, but Harks felt that quiet people often had interesting things to say, if she could just get them talking. The two arrived at the polished stone bridge and walked to the middle of it, where it rose the highest. The sun shone brightly on them, but the air was damp with the mist rising off the river. Behind them, one of the sleeping coaches of the sail train sat, all white wood and tall wheels and open windows. Beyond that, the river gate hung just over the water, ensuring that nothing could enter the city without the guards allowing it. Look! 
Nezzy said, more excited than Harks had ever heard her. Look at the Frosker! Harks looked and couldn't help but smile. The Frosker were the people of the river, and Edgewater was their great city, the last piece of civilization before the uncharted deep of the Wilderwood. The Frosker themselves looked like nothing more than giant frogs, but stood on two legs like humans. Their skin was brightly colored in a variety of dazzling patterns, slate with bright purple, sunny orange with spots of red, teal blue with lemon yellow, and they wore clothes made of pretty shells that click-clacked all over when they walked. I've always wanted to meet the Frosker, Nezzy said, watching the guards. They looked serious, but friendly enough, and they seemed proud to welcome the sail train and its important travelers. Me too, said Harks. Wait, you've never been to the Wilderwood before? I thought you were learning from Shelsani. I, I have been, Nezzy said quickly. We just haven't come to Edgewater yet. I think, um, I think she was saving it for today, to see the city as part of this journey. Oh, that's cool said Harks, craning her neck to see past the sail train to the brass oak walls. Let's get a closer look. Nezzy agreed, and they walked past the sail train into the city. Most of the party had moved on, but a wild crowd still lingered by the gate, cheering loudly for Gorse in the grave as he passed by. As Harks and Nezzy entered, a little frosker, barely more than a tadpole, wobbled up to them, all bright pink with blue zigs. Welcome to Edgewater, she peeped, pressing a necklace of braided moss and water flowers into each of their hands. Are those wizard outfits? she asked, looking at Harks' apprentice robes and Nezzy's druid cloak. Can you two do magic? I want to see a fireball. Whoosh! Boom! <laughs> I'm a druid, Nezzy said, laughing. It's a different sort of magic. Here, what's your name? I'm Gwip, she said. I'm a tass. A tass? asked Harks. A tass, cheered Gwip, bouncing on her rubbery tail. Girls are tasses, boys are tads, I'm a tass. <laughs> okay, my little tass, Nezzy said. Here's a bit of magic for you. She pulled a seed from the moss of her necklace and placed it in the little frosker's hand. What you gonna do? I wanna see. <laughs> Nezzy waved her hand, her eyes flashing green. In an instant, the seed swelled and sprouted into a stubby little flower of pink, with blue marks to match Gwip's own colors. Wow! <laughs> it looks like me! She said, putting her big froggy eyes inches from the bloom without blinking. Do you like it? asked Nezzy. It's okay, but I really want to see a fireball! Bang! Shoom! <laughs> you want a fireball? Asked Harks, rolling up her sleeves. Well, I'm your girl. They call me Harks, Fire Sorceress Supreme. Here we go now. She raised a finger into the air and the tip of it popped into flame like a candle. With a wink at the little tass, Harks pointed her burning nail at the flower in her hand. Yo! Gwip yelped, throwing the flower as it roared into a sudden ball of angry flame. Sorry, sorry, Hark said, looking around to make sure not too many people had seen. Sometimes my fire gets a little excited. Is your hand okay? The little Tass looked at her with wide, trembling eyes. Uh, Gwip? That was amazing! The little Tass said, turning to waddle back to her friends in the river. Did you see that fireball? Zoom! Woof! <laughs> Nezzy and Harks looked at each other and then burst into laughter. Together, they made their way through the streets of Edgewater. They knew they'd be called by their masters soon enough and wanted to see what they could while they could. This is all so amazing, Nezzy said looking everywhere as they walked. This whole city has been grown into place. She pointed out the thick stems that rose out of the river. 
They twisted into wide walkways that wound around thick purple trees, sprouting giant lily pads that formed the homes of the frosker, nestled cozy against the thick bark. Every tree inside the city walls seemed to have a little waterfall, starting somewhere in the leaves, cascading down over the pads and catching the sunlight before pattering to the ground. A few streets laced over the river, even tunneled under it in some spots, but most of the traffic took place on a network of serene canals. The waterways spread and pooled about every tree in the city, making a natural highway before winding back again to meet the river. It's beautiful, Harks agreed. She watched the city in its midday bustle, merchants standing by their shops or sitting behind their wares under lily pad roofs, guards and porters still busy around the sail train in the huge plaza that was known as the Round. There were a few Frosker fishermen in the river, casting small nets and gathering the tiny creatures that fed the city. And the tads and tasses! The schools were closed and hundreds of kids ran and swam through the streets and waters of the city, laughing and chasing each other, the older ones leading the younger ones by the hand or carrying them on their backs. The children chattered to each other continuously, the adults too, and the city was alive with the rhythm of life and nature. As the girls watched, a little tass broke into song. It was high and pure and simple, and without warning, dozens of others joined her. As their voices grew, more and more Frosker picked up the melody, and soon it was carrying across the city, filling the air with a music both rich and sweet. But deeper in the Wilderwood, far on the horizon, darkness gathered, shadows stretched, and evil made itself ready. Their time had come at last. To be continued. Thanks for listening! Thank <laughs> you.